Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, today we have the privilege of hearing from Luke Bobo. Uh, Luke is a mentor of mine, and he's a dear friend of mine and a friend of our families. And I met Luke when I was at Covenant Seminary studying there. And he is the former director of the Francis Schaeffer Institute, where I did an internship and where I had the privilege of learning from Luke back at seminary. So after a career of being an engineer, the director of the Schaefer Institute, and a university professor in St. Louis, Luke and his wife, Rita, uh, now live in Kansas, the Kansas City, Kansas area, where Luke works as the director of strategic partnerships for made, an organization called Made to Flourish. And Made to Flourish is a network of pastors who seek to encourage and resource each other to integrate faith, to integrate faith, work, and economic wisdom for the flourishing of community. And Made to Flourish has a longing to take the gospel in all its fullness uh, to all dimensions of human reality. Luke is also the author of uh, several books and resources around the topics of faith and work race and economics, and biblical interpretation. Luke will be preaching today to us from uh, preaching on the Good Samaritan from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. So let me pray for us as we look further at this passage. Lord, we come to you this morning and we pray, God, that um, you would speak to us. That wherever we're coming from, whatever circumstances and situations we find ourselves in, God, we need to hear from you. And so we pray, God, that you'd use Luke to speak truth to our lives and that, God, your word would draw us closer to you and help us to see your love for us more and more, that we would be moved to go out and love others more and more, to love others well, to serve others and to serve you. So Lord, would you speak to us during this time? This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mark, and good morning, City Press, there in Salt Lake City. I'm happy uh, to be with you guys. Let me encourage you to still have your Bibles handy and turn uh, again to Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. So I want you to imagine a gathering of lawyers, not lawyers in a sense of criminal justice lawyers or prosecutors, but lawyers who were experts in the law. The first five books of the Bible, we call it the Pentateuch. So imagine these lawyers and rabbis like Jesus in this company. And one of the lawyers stands in verse 25 and asks Jesus a question. Teacher, a rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Automatically, I'm sure your light bulbs are going off because this question is a works or salvation by works formulation. Apparently this lawyer um, was not aware of divine grace or Ephesians 2 verses eight through 10. For by grace, we have been saved, not of works lest any man should boast. But again, he asked teacher, rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life, not missing a beat. Jesus says to this man, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? You say, you might say Jesus responds to this lawyer's question with a question. Uh, Jesus is uh, a master in such things. So this lawyer responds in verse 27, much like Jesus has responded before, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind to love your neighbor and to love your neighbor as yourself. We call this the great commandment. Love God with your entire being. Don't hold anything back and to love your neighbor as yourselves. My beloved ethics professor at Covenant Seminary, Dr. Clyde David Clyde Jones would often say this about this love that Jesus is referring about, referring to. This is not quantitatively, but qualitatively. In other words, uh, Jesus is saying the same quality of love 
or standard of love you show yourself, show that to your neighbors. So in verse 28, um, Jesus commends this lawyer for his fine Jewish answer. Jesus adds, now do this and you will live. With this response, Jesus is putting an end to legalism. With this response, Jesus is saying to this lawyer, essentially, practice what you preach. You see, to love God with all we got, with our entire being, and to love our neighbors as ourselves is to truly live. That is the good life, beloved. The good life is not in the accumulation of things and titles. The good life is comprised of loving God and loving our neighbor. This lawyer has been, you might say, shamed because uh, Christ gets him to answer his own question. So you might say this lawyer wants to have the last word. So he asks a follow-up question to justify himself. He says, or asks, who is my neighbor? With this question, he has revealed his bias. He knew to love his Jewish neighbors or kindred. With this question, he's trying to understand who might be considered non-neighbors, those he's not responsible to love. That is the meaning of wanting to justify himself. So notice Jesus doesn't answer his question directly, but Jesus tells a story in verses 30 through 35. And this story has a shocking twist. A man, likely a Jew, was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And this road would have been quite familiar to Jesus' audience. It stretched 18 miles, and it included long stretches of rocky terrain, ideal places for robbers to hide in secret, ready to ambush unsuspecting travelers as he walked this 18-mile stretch. And for Jesus' audience, they would have been at the edge of their seats because mentioning this, this road meant acute danger. So this unidentified man is ambushed, violated, e economically um, unjustly treated, He's robbed. He's stripped of his clothes. He's probably stripped of any material possessions that he has. He's beaten. Think pistol whipped. And there he laid in his own blood. Assaulted, violated, left for dead. Can't you hear this dear man groaning and moaning and crying out, please help me? Perhaps he cried like George Floyd. I can't breathe. Mama, I'm through. Yet this injured man is in luck because a priest, the first, first responder, happens to be traveling that same road. However, this priest hesitates because he's likely thinking about Leviticus verse 21, verse 1 through 4, where it states that he is not to touch a dead person because otherwise he would become contaminated. There are exceptions made in that text. He can touch a dead person if, it's, if the person is part of his immediate family, but this man certainly doesn't qualify as someone part of his immediate family. So not risking kept contamination, this priest says, see you later to this dead man or half-dead man. He says, see you later, and crosses the street and hurries on his way to, I presume, an appointment. Not long after the priest crosses the street, here comes a Levite, an assistant to the priest. He looks on from afar at this man from across the street and goes the other way and hurries on to his next appointment and leaves this injured man, someone made in God's image, to die. Both these religious persons put their ceremonial purity 
above tending to a man made in God's image. I'm sure God is quite outraged at this priest and this Levite's lack of help to this man. Both these religious persons fail to see this dear man as part of their immediate human family. Every person is part of a human family or human race. Both the priest and Levite were willing to, unwilling to love this man. Both this priest and Levite were unwilling to love this man, their neighbor. Both this priest and this Levite got the letter of the law correct. Sadly, they miss the spirit of the law. The priest and this Levite failed to value a person over a ceremonial law. They missed the idea that the Old Testament, Jesus did this, the entire Old Testament can be summarized with two commands, to love God, to love neighbor. So not long after the Levite has departed or left the scene, here comes someone Jesus' audience least expects, a Samaritan. Perhaps they expected a Israelite lay person, a layman. They certainly didn't expect this third character, a Samaritan man. But let me remind you that the man left for dead is likely a Jewish man. Let me also remind you that Samaritans had no dealings with Jews. Let me remind you that Jews considered Samaritans half-breeds, illegitimate, theologically ill-informed. A Jew, if given the option to allow the shadow of a Samaritan to fall on him or walk in a ditch, a Jew would choose walking in a ditch each and every time. Samaritans hated Jews and Jews hated Samaritans. That makes John 4 all the more remarkable because as you know, Jesus goes through Samaria this Samaritan brother saw the man, has compassion on him, and stops. The word compassion means to have pity for, is to have this visceral reaction, this pit in your stomach, is to have a feeling for someone who falls or suffers misfortune. The Greek word for compassion here is the same word, same word that Luke uses for the father's compassion for his prodigal son. In Luke 15, it's the same word, this word compassion, that Matthew uses for Jesus as he looks out over the crowd in Matthew 9, 36. You see, biblical compassion, my friends, has two parts. It's, one is to be moved to feel something, but biblical compassion also means to be moved to concrete action. I just wonder, I just wonder, have we become numb or indifferent to the sufferings of others? And I get it. I get it. It can be overwhelming to think about all manner of sufferings in this world. Sex trafficking, child abuse, domestic abuse, child pornography, poverty, racial injustice. There's so many sufferings, so many manners of sufferings in this world and to get involved is so so messy but let me encourage you my friends to pick one and enter in and be a champion for it yes be moved with feeling but also be moved to action to be a champion of that particular suffering many were moved by what they witnessed as that minnesota police officer placed his knee on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes. And that's good and noble. However, what about where you live and play at this particular moment, where God has planted you there in Salt Lake City? Are you moved by the suffering of others in your own neighborhood, in your own city, there in Salt Lake? Driven by compassion, this Samaritan man takes out his first aid kit. He administers oil and wine to this man's wounds. He 
put bandages on his wounds. He puts him on his own animal, takes him to an inn, and nurses him all night. The next morning, he gives the innkeeper money for any additional medical expenses and says, if he incurs any more expenses, put that on my tab and I will reconcile that bill on my return trip. Jesus ends his story with another question to this lawyer wishing to justify himself. In verse 36, Jesus asks, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan man, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man left for dead, the man who fell among robbers? Which of the three? The lawyer could not even utter the word Samaritan so he answers, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus' final words to this lawyer and to us, in verse 37, be like this good Samaritan. You go and do likewise. You go and do likewise. You go and do the same. So what, what do you think this lawyer was thinking after Jesus' lesson on neighborly love or showing neighborly love? I can think of three things this lawyer was thinking. Number one, he was thinking, boy, I, sh I should have kept my big mouth shut and not ask that follow-up question. Number two, this lawyer was probably thinking, you know, my idea of a neighbor was much too narrow. Everyone is my neighbor, regardless of their sexual orientation, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their race, regardless of their gender, regardless if they are poor or rich, regardless if they are locked up or free, regardless if they're famous or not, everyone is my neighbor. I, you, we cannot pick and choose who to show neighborly love to. Every person, every person is a candidate to benefit from neighborly love. What about you? Is your view of your neighbor or who is your neighbor too narrow? Number three, this lawyer was probably thinking, I should repent because I have not loved my neighbors this way. You see, neighborly love or mercy is costly. This Samaritan risks his life. This dangerous road, these robbers could have been still hiding ready to assault him, the Samaritan man. The Samaritan risks infection. There were no latex gloves. He couldn't don a mask before he handled this man's blood and his wounds. The Samaritan paid out of his own pocket to cover the stranger's expenses. Showing this, showing this neighborly love to this injured man cost the Samaritan time that he could not recover. You see, neighborly love or mercy is disruptive. The Samaritan, likely a businessman, had to miss important appointments there in Jericho, a city of commerce. The Samaritan likely lost money and missed out on networking opportunities because he cared for this dear man. Every believer is called to love their neighbors as themselves, pastors, church members, deacons, trustees, church leaders, those whole positions in the church are also called to show neighborly love. No one, no believer is exempt. So let me ask you, City Press, are you showing neighborly love to the majority culture there, of Mormons in Salt Lake City? Are you showing neighborly love to Mormons there in Salt Lake City? Let me ask you, City Press, are you showing neighborly love to those who reside in the 84112, 84112 zip code? My research tells me that those who live in the zip code are some of the poorest who live there in Salt Lake City. Let me ask you, City Press, how are you showing neighborly love to medical professionals tending to COVID patients? Let me ask you finally, City Press, how are you showing neighborly love?
to Mark and Melissa and Noel and Luke and Max and singing Leo. We are to love like the Samaritan. City prayers, go and do likewise. Amen, and God bless you.